All right, it's good to see you this morning in the Lord's house, and um, I'm changing things up just a tad bit this morning, but for this reason. Um, we just need to go to the Lord in prayer. I've got three people, and there may be others, but um, Miss Jessica Allman, that's Brother Monty, Miss Sheila's daughter, you know, she's pregnant, and she is, I think, headed to the hospital now, uh, trying to go into labor. But the baby is not really due until uh, November. So that's way too early. So we need to pray right now for that precious child and pray for Jessica and, uh, and, and Brett, too, of course, and just want to remember that family in prayer. Then I just found out a moment ago, Brother Ronald Smith back there is going to have surgery tomorrow. He's got blockage that has to be cleared. Then another young man in our church, Michael Futch. Now, I can't give you any details, but I just know he's, he's trying to rebuild his home from the flood last year, and there was some type of accident with a skill saw, and something was cut. Now, I'm not real sure. and don't know the extent of the damage or anything like that. I've tried calling. I've, I've made every contact that I know to make, and I can't get word. But we can still pray. Amen. So remember Michael Fudge, Ronald Smith, and Jessica Amen. So here's what I want us to do, those of you that can. This is serious business. This is serious business, all three. Would you come join me at the altar and let's pray for our church family? You know, there's an old saying, a family that prays together does what? Stays together. So let's pray and pray for these that are been mentioned and then... Let's just pray for our service this morning that the Holy Spirit might be in charge from beginning to end. Is there any other request today before we pray? Any particular? Wonder if there's just maybe an unspoken. You don't want to call it out, but you just have an unspoken. Lift your hand. Amen. Okay. Just lift these. Pray for Jessica right now. Pray for the precious babe that's in her womb. And let's just pray that the doctors might be able to take care of Jessica and her precious child. And pray for Brother Ronald as he prepares for surgery tomorrow. That God would guide the hands of the surgeon. Pray for Michael Futch. Our Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we come to you today now lifting Jessica, her new babe. I pray, Lord, that you would stop the contraction, stop the pain, the labor pains. Lord, I pray you'd intervene. And even now as we're praying that the labor would stop. Put a hedge about Jessica and that precious child. I pray for Brother Ronald. I pray as he goes tomorrow for this surgery, for this procedure, that you'll bless him, that you'll guide the doctor's hands, the surgeon. Pray that there'll be no complications. Pray for complete healing. I pray for Michael. Lord, I don't know the extent of his injuries, but you do, and you're in charge. So would you bring comfort, ease the pain? And Lord, we pray for others. There's been other names mentioned. There's been unspoken requests. You know the needs. So we lift them all to you today and pray that your will might be done. Now, Holy Spirit, would you fall fresh and anew upon us today. I pray you'll anoint every song that is sung, anoint every word that is spoken. You promised, Lord, that if we would lift you up, you'd draw all men unto yourself. So today, Lord, we do lift you up. It's all about you, Lord. It's not about us. God, you're the audience. So now be pleased, Lord, and our worship, in Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen and amen. All right. Praise be the Lord.
Well, church family, it's good to see you this morning. I hope you have come here for the sole purpose of worshiping the Lord this morning. For worship is not about us. It's not about us receiving anything. It's not a, about a fuzzy feeling that we get, but it's about worshiping the one who died for us. Amen. So would you stand up with us? Sing this good old song that talks about that. He keeps me singing. Let's sing this. If there's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with you. Peace be still in all of life's ebb and flow. Come on, let's sing it. It's Jesus, 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 the sweetest thing I know. He fills my as I go and all my life was wrecked by sin and strife discord filled my heart with pain for Jesus swept across the broken strings stirred the slumping chords again come on church let's sing it and Jesus 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 the sweetest name he fills my every longing. He keeps me singing as I go. Here it is. For soon he's coming back to welcome me. Far beyond the starry sky. And I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. And I shall ring with him on high. Amen. Let's sing it. For Jesus, 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 the sweetest name I know. And he fills my every longing. He keeps me singing as I go. And it's Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. keep singing all right you know jesus in your heart this morning oh that was sad that was sad you know jesus in your heart this morning amen amen so i want you to sing this song out since jesus came into my heart let's sing it all right in just a minute there we go there we go <laughs> what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since jesus came into my heart and I have light in my soul for as long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Oh, since Jesus came into my heart. The floods of joy o'er my soul like to see windows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, and I have ceased from my wandering and going astray since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins, which were many, have all washed away since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy or my soul like to see pillows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, and I shall go there to dwell in that city I know. Since Jesus came into my heart, and I'm happy, so happy. Since 
Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy on my soul, like to see pillows of hope. Miss Jackie, I want you to do something for me. Go back to that last verse. I want you to see something. There we go. And I'm happy, so happy. As onward I go. Now, some of you happy is not showing real well this morning. Some of you not as happy as you should be. You see, because we just talked about there's a melody in our heart. When Jesus comes to live in us, he gives us a new song. Amen. He gives us a, a new joy, a new life, a new, uh, uh, just a new everything. Because, you see, he can't take our brokenness and put it back together and expect it to be what he gave us. I know that didn't make a lot of sense for you. You see, when we get saved, we're broken. We're messed up. Amen. We, we're just full of sin. And see, God don't want that same sin. He didn't want to use what, what was messed up in the first place. He says, you have a new creation, a new creature. You are different than you once were. He throws the old self away and gives you a new self, gives you what he wants you to have. And that's better than anything we could ever want. Amen. And so when he comes in, you, you're supposed to be happy, joyful, full of love. Because he is love. When he comes in you, he is love. So therefore, you should love. He is joy. So when he comes in you, you should have some joy. We'll get there. All right. So I want us to sing this last verse real quick. I know it's a hymn you've heard all your life. But I want these words to sink in that you came for. You'll be singing it all week and being mad at me all week because you've been singing this. All right. So I shall go there to dwell. When we get there, it's going to be happy. It's going to be joyous. Amen. It ain't going to be no sorrow, no sadness. It's going to be wonderful. All right. So let's sing this. And I shall go there to dwell in that city I know since Jesus came into my heart. And I'm so happy as hard when I go since Jesus came into my heart. And since Jesus came into my heart, and floods of joy o'er my soul, like to see pillows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. Hey. Good to have you today in our service, especially the guests here with us today. Would you please take a moment to fill out the card that's attached to your worship bulletin? And then you can either drop it in the plate or bring it to me. I'll be in the foyer at the close of the service. I have a gift I'd love to give you before you leave out today. Now, we love to fellowship around here. So, Mildale, turn around and find someone you don't recognize. Give them a hug. Make everyone welcome this morning in our worship.
Amen. We taught you this song a couple weeks ago. So I want you to sing it again. All right, we fall down. Let's sing. voices. Holy, holy, holy is 
We just thank you for who you are. The God, you are still King of kings and Lord of lords. No matter the situations of this life, God, you are in control. So, Father, I pray this morning that would become a reality for us, that we would trust you in everything. So, Father, I thank you just for who you are this morning, that you are holy, you are great, and you are mighty. And, God, we just love you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Number two, we'll get it here in just a minute. Start up. Oh 
with you this morning turn with me to first peter chapter one. First peter chapter one children are going to children's church so if you'd like for your child or your children to go they're headed out that way now we're so glad that you're here worshiping with us today at milldale and i hope that you'll be back next sunday next sunday is a very special day july the second our um I was going to say, where's the bulletin? <laughs> Liberty Celebration Service. <laughs> I've called it Freedom Sunday for so many years, I cannot get away from that. So it's Liberty Celebration next Sunday. We'll have a very special service at this time next week. And then at 4 p.m., everything will begin. We have a picnic beginning at 4 o'clock. We have all the hamburgers and hot dogs and 
chicken nuggets and you name it. And we're just going to have a great picnic, have an outdoor concert next Sunday evening beginning at 6 p.m. And um, going to have the national anthem, believing that we're going to have a military flyover, got a jet supposed to fly over, buzz our church about the time we'll do the national anthem. And then we've got major fireworks next Sunday night. Or, yeah, Sunday night. It's going to be part, it'll probably be about 8.30. But the reason for that is the fireworks company said that for it to be good, for everybody to enjoy, it's got to be as dark as possible. Okay, so that's, we're probably going to do that around 8.30. All you need to do is bring your lawn chair. And if you're a member of the church, I need you to bring tomatoes and lettuce and ice cream and watermelon and you name it. It won't go to waste. I promise you. First Peter, the first chapter, beginning in the 13th verse. First Peter, chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here, here on earth, and do so in fear. What did we do before the days of answer machines and cell phones? Now, if you were like me, you probably had a pretty boring message on your answer machine or on your iPhone, on the, uh, the answering portion of it. I, mine today is just whatever was built into my phone. It just says at the sound of the tone, leave a message, and I'll call you back. I used to answer it. It was my voice. It would just say, hello, this is Brother Dennis. I'm not able to answer your call at this time, but if you'll leave me your name and number, I'll get back with you as soon as I possibly can. I was reading the other day, and I come across some pretty funny messages that people have over the years either put on their answer machine or their cell phone, and I wanted to share just a few of them with you this morning. I like this one. It said, Hi, John's answer machine is broken. This is his refrigerator. Please speak slowly, and I'll stick your message to me with one of those little magnets. Greetings. You have reached the ESP Research Department. <laughs> we know who you are, and we know what you want. So at the sound of the tone, please hang up. And this is an actual recording from AT&T. Listen to this one. The number you have reached, 226-0477, is disconnected or no longer in service. The new number is 226-0477. Please make note of it. Y'all didn't get that one, did you? <laughs> Hello. I'm not answering the phone. I'm trying to avoid an obnoxious person. Leave a message, and if I don't call you back, you know it's you. I wonder if we were to call heaven right now and God's answer machine were to pick up, I wonder what would God say? I got to thinking about that. Perhaps God's answer machine would say this. Listen closely. Hello? This is God. I'm holy. So you too. Better be holy. After all, the Bible does tell us, write this down in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19 and verse 2, God says, you shall be holy, 
For I, the Lord your God, am holy. You know what I discovered? That is a message that is repeated over and over and over throughout the Bible. And some, listen, when something is repeated over and over and over, apparently God wants us to get it. The Lord is trying to say something to us when it's repeated over and over and over. Paul, in the passage that I've just read to you, he's actually laying the foundation about the meaning of salvation. And in this passage, watch this, beginning in the 13th verse, he actually continues the theme, and then he adds to our salvation the concept of holiness. Oh, he says, gird up the loins of your mind. He says, be sober and rest your hope fully upon, watch this, the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I want to speak to us for a few moments this morning on a hunger for holiness. I want to ask that question. Is it your heart's desire to be holy? Would you consider yourself today to be a holy person? Well, that's a word that we use a lot today, but I believe the word holy is a word that is often misunderstood. And a lot of times we use the word holy in a phrase, in a sentence, that perhaps we shouldn't even be using it. For example, have you ever heard of anyone use the phrase, holy Toledo? You ever heard that phrase? I, 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 I was guilty. I said, I used that expression several years ago, and someone come up to me and immediately said, Pastor, I used to live in Toledo. There's nothing holy about it. <laughs> and when I was growing up, I can't believe what I'm about to admit. When I was growing up, I used to love to watch Batman and Robin. Boy, Robin used the word a lot. I remember one episode when Batman turned to Robin and said, Robin, the Batmobile gas tank is empty. And Robin replied, holy gas tank, Batman. Do you use that word? Is the word holy in your vocabulary? Now I wonder, if I were describing you to someone else, and if I were to say about you, he or she is funny, friendly, loving, caring, compassionate, and holy. Could I say that about you? All of those other uh, descriptive words have a favorable definition, except the word holy. Think of it. We hear today, we hear the phrase many times used like holier than thou or holy Joe or Lord forbid, a holy roller. And anytime those descriptions are used, I promise you they're not paying you a compliment. Watch this. A lot of times when we think of the word holy, we think of the Pentecostal holiness movement that began in the 1900s. Now think about that for just a moment. There are women not allowed to wear makeup, certainly cannot wear pants, they can only wear dresses, and they can never cut their hair. But now listen to me, no disrespect but the way you wear your hair or whether you wear makeup or not or wear pants or dresses has nothing to do with holiness. Amen. Let's examine the scripture this morning. And here's the key. What does the Bible say? What is the true meaning 
of holiness. What does it mean when we say we are holy? I have two thoughts that I find in my study time this week. And the first, I want us to examine God's holiness. God's holiness. And then secondly, let's discuss what it means for us to be holy. First of all, holiness is the primary attribute of God. Holiness is the primary attribute of God. There are a lot of words in the Bible that actually describes the character and the nature of God. For example, this is what we find in the Scripture. God is spirit. God is light. God is love. God is merciful. God is our shepherd. God is our rock. God is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. God is also Jehovah Rapha, our healer. God is also El Shaddai, the mighty one. And I can just go on and on and on and share with you the very names given to describe the very nature of the God that we serve. Watch this. I could preach a series of sermons every Sunday for the remainder of the year and still not scratch the surface. And yet there is one that is repeated over and over and over throughout the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, and it's this word, that God is what? Holy. God is a holy God. Write down Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. The prophet Isaiah had a vision of heaven. He sees the Lord high and lifted up. And in that vision, he could see seraphims around the throne of God. And Isaiah says this, that those seraphims, those angels around the throne of God are shouting out in unison together, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. The whole earth is full of the glory of God. Wow. When we study the scriptures, we find many times that word holy. But watch this. One thing you'll always notice in both the Old and the New Testament, it is always repeated three times. You'll never see just holy. You'll never see holy, holy. It's always holy, Holy, holy. Why? Why is it repeated like that in the Scripture? First of all, in the Jewish thoughts, the Jewish ideas, the number three is always a divine number. Why is number three a divine number? Father, Son, Spirit. And everybody should say, amen. It's the Father, God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, when you look in Revelation, and we've been studying Revelation on Wednesday nights, and every account that we found in our study of Revelation the Bible says that the angels around the throne of God are constantly saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. He is perfect in His holiness. Amen. He is perfect in His holiness. Okay, Pastor, God's holy. But what does that actually mean for us? Explain that for us this morning. I believe I have it on your outline. First of all, the Hebrew word, kadah. The Hebrew word kadah literally means to cut apart. To cut apart or to separate. The New Testament Greek word is the word hegias. It has the same root meaning for the word sanctified or the word consecrated. So it basically means this. It means separate, distinct, I like this one, different. That's what it means. So for working definition, let's just say this. The word holy means set apart or 
me bring it right down in terms that we can understand it right here in Louisiana. Holy means to be different. Amen. It means simply to be different. An example. What do we call this book? All right. Mine used to say, but it's faded, it's gone, it's been rubbed off. Mine used to say on here, Holy Bible. Why do we call this the Holy Bible? Because it's the only book written by God. In other words, this book is different than any other book. Amen. Biblos is the word, and it means book. This is the holy book. This is the holy Bible. It is the inerrant, the inspired, the infallible word of God. No other book like this book. Amen. The Jews talk about the holy temple that once stood on the temple mound in downtown Jerusalem. Why did they call it the holy temple? Because it was the only building built for the purpose of worship to the true and the living God. So when we say that God is holy, what we're saying is this. He is different. He is unique. There is not another creature, there is not another human being anywhere in the universe like our God. Amen. He is truly the one and only. Write down Psalms, Psalms 89, verse 7 and 8. Listen to what the psalmist said. He says, in the counsel of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. O oh, Lord God Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty, O oh Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. Wow. John the Revelator said in the book of Revelation, chapter 4 and verse 8, listen to what he recorded there. John says that the angels of glory, day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Wow. There's no God like our God. He's holy. I remember growing up in my home church in Pensacola, and I remember this, goodness, I, I was a child, a small child. And listen, we had the old blue Baptist hymnal in our church. And I can remember like yesterday, hymn number one. What was it? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, earth. Early in the morning, our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Hallelujah, church. I'm so glad that we sang songs this morning about the holiness of God. Now listen, I'm just delivering the mail. God said, I am holy. Therefore, you and you and you and you and you and myself, we should be what? Holy. Are you holy? Let's examine that. Because you see, our holiness is actually a reflection of God's nature. The holiness that is in you, the holiness that's in you, the holiness that's in you, the holiness that's in me this morning is simply a reflection of the very nature of God. God says, I'm holy, so you be holy. And here in our text, Paul gives us some practical advice on how we can reflect the holiness of God in all of our lives. He didn't just say, now, you be holy, 
and then left it up to us trying to figure out how to do that. No, what does he get? He goes into detail. Beginning in verse 13, he actually lays out five principles. There are five areas of our lives where holiness ought to operate, where holiness ought to be seen every day, every moment of every single day in our lives. Now, watch this, church. Can I tell you something? I'm not just to be holy on Sunday. I'm supposed to be holy all through the week. I'm supposed to be holy 24 hours a day. So how do we live a holy life? What needs to be evident in our lives? What, is the, what are the five areas of our lives where holiness needs to be seen? Now, I'll tell you this. I've been preaching to myself all week. I love you. Holiness actually involves our mind. You have to decide every day to be holy. Holiness, I said, involves our minds. We have to decide to be holy. And Paul writes here in our text that he says, prepare your minds for action. So holiness begins with having the right attitude. You must have the right attitude. You must decide every day that I'm going to be holy. Listen, when I got in the car to come to work, or come to work. <laughs> when I got in the car to come to church this morning, I pulled out onto the Greenville Springs Port Hudson Road, and the sun was shining. What in the cloud in the sky? I hadn't seen that, seems like, since I... Moved to Louisiana. <laughs> and guess what they were playing on the radio? Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. They was praying hymn number one in the blue hymn book. It was amazing. I like to run off the road. God is a holy God. I, coming down the highway, said, Lord, that's it. Not only is that the message for today, but God, I want to be holy today. God, I want to live my life today in such a fashion that the world might see Jesus in me. You've got to decide. You have to make a decision to be holy. Amen. Now, I love this because let's understand what Paul is saying here. The King James Version of verse 13, the King James says, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, what's he saying in verse 13? You got to understand the background. In Bible times, most men would wear a long flowing robe. And so anytime a man wanted to run, he would have to gather, pick up that robe and gather it up and tuck it in his belt. That was called girding of the loins. That would be like us saying today, listen, that would be almost like saying, roll up your sleeves. In other words, you've got to make a conscious deci decision every day, I'm going to be holy today. I'm going to be like God today. Watch this. He says in this passage, get ready. Be holy. Get ready. Roll up your sleeves. Roll up your gown. Tuck it under your belt. And be intent on being holy today. Was that your prayer this morning? Here's where we are. And I'm being honest now. It's sad. Too many of us have a desire to be happy rather than holy. We're wanting to be happy. We're wanting everything to go our way. A.W. Tozer wrote these words. He says, the emphasis of the New Testament is not upon happiness, but rather upon holiness. Wow. Can I tell you something? God is more concerned with the state of your heart than he is the state of your feelings. 
God is more interested right now in the condition of your heart rather than if you're happy or not. Hello. We ought to go before God right now. Now watch this. This is a prayer that ought to be prayed with every one of us. God, my prayer and my desire today, God, is I want to be holy at any cost. God, my desire this morning is I would rather be holy today than to be happy. God, more than anything else, if I'm not happy, if all my needs are not, not met, I just still want to be holy. Are y'all with me? Let me tell you something. You can be assured that come the end of the day, you will be as happy as you are holy. So here's the end result. You want to be happy? Be holy. You want to have the joy of the Lord? Be holy. You want to have all your needs met? Be holy. You want God to open the windows of heaven and pour so many blessings upon you that there not be room enough to contain it? Then be holy. God says, I'm holy. Therefore, you too shall be holy. So holiness has to begin in the mind. But secondly, holiness involves our will. We've got to learn to practice self-control. If you're going to be holy, you have to learn to exercise self-control. Peter writes about it. He says, be self-controlled. Your will is actually a part of your soul that determines what you do, where you go, what you say. The world calls it willpower. Now, according to the world, if I can't lose weight, it's because I don't have willpower. Well, I about decided <laughs> I don't have no willpower. <laughs> <laughs> I can't lose it. But now watch this. Did you know that it was your will that caused you to get up, get out of bed this morning, get dressed, and drive down to this church to study the Bible and to worship? Amen. You made the decision in your mind you was going to get up. But it's your will that caused it to happen. Hello, amen or oh me. Peter's writing about our need to exercise self-control when we are tempted to sin. Uh-oh. Time to meddle just a little bit. It's your will that says no when you're tempted to sin. A few years ago, it was First Lady Nancy Reagan that started a drug campaign in America, and her slogan was simply what? Just say no. Now, hold on, follow me for just a moment. Just simply resisting temptation is often much harder than just simply saying no. Amen. Come on. It, it is for me. It's a whole lot harder than just simply saying no. Here's why. Here's why. We all have an external source of temptation. You know what the external source of temptation is in our lives? He has a name. Satan. Satan. 
But all of us, we also have an internal source of temptation. You know what the internal source of our temptation is? The Bible calls it the flesh. The Bible calls it self. It's the big I. I gets me in trouble a lot. Amen. I says, go ahead. If it feels good, do it. Come on. That's why. I'm not going to show it all. I'm going to cover it up. I says, boy, that's good. I says, whoo, that'll make you feel good. I'm sorry, but it's true. And if we be honest, every one of us in here, we struggle with something. And you know what? In God's eyes, what I struggle with is no different than what you struggle with. Your struggle might be different than mine. Mine's different from yours, and yours are different from that. But we all struggle. Mine just happens to be bluebell. <laughs> or bunny. Bluebell. Cookies and cream. Homemade vanilla. Chocolate. I got the best of me last night. Hello. Well, I, I can't blame it on the devil. Oh, yeah, the devil can put it in my path. But he can't make me eat it. I chose to indulge. Hello, church. Come on. So you know what? Here's what the Lord's shown me. If I'm going to live a holy life, I have to decide daily. And for me, I'm not speaking for you, I'm speaking for me. I have to do this several times throughout the day, and if I'm going to live holy, I have to die daily. I have to crucify self I have to die to self. Listen, the voice of self must be silenced. And if I don't silence the voice of self, it will always lead me to sin. I feel like I'm on something here. I didn't just put this together today. Are y'all listening? I'm just, come on, I'm just, I'm going to be, take it, take my mask off. Every day, it's a battle. Every day, whether it's because somebody's crossed my path or go home and turn on the television, go home and open the refrigerator, It's hard. It's a struggle. It's a battle. We must die daily. Let me tell you something. In every one of your hearts, in every man, every woman, every young person in this room today, including this pastor, every one of us, we have a throne in the inside of our hearts. And here's the, here's the difference. Here's where the rubber meets the road. Every time I get in trouble with the big eye, every time I get in trouble because of self, it's because I'm sitting on that throne. So this morning, before I could get to the God's house, before I could get here to Miller, I had to dethrone self. I had to say, Seth, you got to get off that throne. I have to allow Jesus to be the one that sits upon the throne of my heart. I'm telling you, when Jesus is the one who is sitting on the throne of my heart, I'm being honest, now, I, don't have, I don't have the temptation. I don't have a trouble. I don't have a hard time saying no. 
Where I have trouble is when myself is sitting on the throne. And everybody should say, because that's true. It's true. So who's sitting on the throne of your heart right now? Let me tell you something. Jesus not only wants to be your Savior, he wants to be our Lord. And to be our Lord means this. He's the one in control. He's the one that's in charge. Is he the Lord of your heart today? Is he the one right now that is sitting on the throne? We got to exercise self-control. Self-control is one of the gifts of the Spirit or one of the fruits of the Spirit. So we got to surrender. Lord, you today be in charge of my heart. Lord, you be in charge of my life today because I want to be holy. Amen. Thirdly, holiness, it involves our future. Watch this. We have a hope based upon God's grace. In verse 13, Paul writes, Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now, that phrase means to completely establish your hope. To completely establish your hope. I wish I'd have put this on your outline, but I didn't. But you can do it right now. But use the word hope, H-O-P-E. Let's use it as an acrostic for just a moment. What does hope stand for? H-O-P-E means having only positive expectations. Having only positive expectations. You see, the source of our hope today is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That is our hope this morning. That's what keeps me keeping on. That's why I can continue to put one foot in front of the other. In Titus 2.13, Paul says, we're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Once in a while, not too often, once in a while, Hollywood can come out with a pretty decent movie. In 1994, they did just that. They came out in 1994 with a movie that was titled The Shawshank Redemption. How many of you saw the movie? It was a great movie. It was actually a movie about hope. I've seen the movie several times. It was a settings of the 40s when a banker by the name of Andy was unjustly convicted of murdering his wife. He didn't do it. He received two life sentences. No hope of him ever getting out of prison. And in prison, he met a man by the name of Red. Red had been in prison for so long, he'd give up all hope. And every time he'd go before the parole board, they would deny his release and all hope was just about gone. But Andy began to tell Red about a place next to a cornfield underneath an oak tree by a stone wall fence. There's a treasure hidden. And if you ever get out and go find that treasure, you'll be taken care of. And in my recollection, Red finally, the day came, he got out of jail. And he went and he dug and he found that treasure just like his friend Andy had told him. I'm telling you, my friend, we've got reason. We have a reason today to live a holy life. We have a reason today to keep on keeping on. Amen? His name is Jesus. Wow! What a treasure actually awaits for us out there. One of these glorious days, we're going to be released from this life. And we're going to step over on the other side. And I'm telling you, there was a treasure. One day it was buried, but now it's a resurrected treasure. And one of
of these glorious days when we step over on the other side. We're going to behold his face. We will see him one day in all of his glory. That gives me hope today. That gives me something to hold on to. Just thinking about that, that I'm going to see him one day. One of these glorious days, I'm going to be in his presence. Ought to cause me right now in the here and the now to live a holy life. You remember that old hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and Righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean. What? On Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. You've got every reason today to smile. You've got every reason in the world today to hold your head high. We've got something to look forward to. Amen. And just knowing what the future holds ought to cause us to live holy lives. Well, let's go on. Holiness involves your conduct. Here's where it gets real personal. We must dare to be different. We must dare to be different. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived back in the days of ignorance. In other words, don't live today the way you used to live when you were lost. Listen to me, church. Don't live today like you used to live when you didn't know Jesus. You had an excuse back then because you was ignorant. But now you don't have an excuse. Now you know. Now you know what God expects of us. You have no excuse after this message today, after this service today. Here's why. Because God says in his word, I'm holy, so you, 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 and you, son, be holy too. Dare to be different. Holiness involves acting different than the way the world acts. Are you all with me? I'm going to share something with you, and I don't want you to fall out of your chair. Holiness has absolutely nothing to do with how long or how short I wear my hair. Has absolutely nothing to do with the style of clothes that I wear. I've told you once, I was told years ago, that if I was going to be a man of God, if I was going to be a preacher, I had to wear a white shirt. Holiness has nothing to do with what color shirt I wear. Now listen to me. Holiness is such a radical lifestyle that you're different than everybody else. And in actuality, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. Hollywood, Hollywood pro portrays Christians like this. To listen to Hollywood, Christians are people that has a Bible in one hand and a bloody knife in the other hand. That's the way they want to portray Christians today. Hollywood wants to promote us as being holy fanatics. I'll be the first to tell you, I know a bunch of fanatics. I, I, I've been around some holy nuts. 
Now, I say that because, and you'll probably remember this, but just a few years ago, there was a lady, I believe somewhere, and she was in Texas, I want to say somewhere outside the Houston area, who said that she had gone in prayer and God told her to drown her children in the bathtub. And she drowned them. And she said God told her to do it. Listen to me. God didn't tell her to drown them babies. Just like the girl over in the East Coast several years ago that strapped her two children in the back seat of her car and drove it off into the lake. God told her to do No, God didn't tell her to do that. Amen? Yeah, there's some weirdos out there. Being holy makes you different. Being holy makes you different doesn't make you weird. Hello? Let me put it another way. Being holy makes you different. It doesn't make you stupid. Did you know that to be holy doesn't mean that you have to shave your head and drag a life-size cross all around Baton Rouge? That's not what holiness means. Being holy does not mean that you have to take a vow of poverty or silence or move to a monastery. Being holy means... That you live such a God-spirit-filled life that you can't help but to be kind. You can't help to be gentle. You cannot help but to be loving. I'm telling you, when you live the life that God has called you to live, you can't help but to be like Jesus. Now, as I've studied the Scripture, I, I, I see that Jesus probably lived the, the godliest, the holiest life of any man that's ever walked the face of the earth. And you know what the Holy Spirit reminded me this week? Now, this is taken from the New Testament. Jesus hung around prostitutes and drunkards. He told stories. He made people laugh. He was without sin. He never, ever compromised his divine nature. He was holy. He was godly. And yet, watch this. Jesus had the kind of personality that the Bible says that the common people heard him gladly. Just the ordinary, everyday Joe wanted to be around Jesus. And did you know the only people that didn't want to be around him were the uptight religious people who were more concerned with the way people dressed and the things they eat or they didn't eat. Jesus was just an ordinary... Listen... He blended in. He didn't stick out like a sore thumb. Amen. And people wanted to be around him. I remember years ago, several years ago, four or five years ago, one of the headlines in a Florida paper, this was the headlines, his black bold print, it said, crowd tramples woman during pre-holiday sale. Walmart had put DVDs half price. One particular lady got there 12 hours before the doors were supposed to open. Wasn't long that hundreds of other, hundred other people began to gather. And when the doors opened in the wee hours on Black Friday, they trampled over that woman like a herd of buffalo. She spent several days in intensive care. They interviewed her sister. This is what her sister said. She said, 
My sister Patricia got pushed down and they walked over her like a herd of elephants. All they cared about was a stupid DVD. I remember that article. I remember the story it made national news, and I remember thinking, I wonder, were there any Christians in that group that morning? I wonder why no one stopped to aid the woman. I wonder why no one bent down to check to see if she was even alive. All people had on their mind was just getting the DVD. That's where the world is today. Give me, give me, give me. And we don't care about those that are around us. We read the stories like that and we think, boy, if I had been there, I would have checked on her. Had I been there, I would have called 911. Would you really? You know what's amazing? There's people all around us right now that are hurting. There's people sitting in this very room right now. Lonely. Their whole world has been turned upside down. Do we care enough about people to go to them and put our arms around them and show them some love and affection and kindness? Friend, that's what Jesus would do. I believe that we're supposed to show kindness to strangers. And listen to me. Listen to me. Listen. Most of the time, we don't know what's going on in a particular situation. And rather than acting like we think we know what's going on or we think we know, no, listen to me. We ought to approach people gentle, kindness, love, compassion. But for the grace of God, it could be you on the other end. Hello? If we're holy, it'll be seen in the way we treat people. Let me close with this. Holiness, it involves your judgment. You better have respectful fear of God. You better have a respectful fear of God. Now, Peter concludes with the best motivation, I think, for being holy. What is it? Verse 17, he says in verse 17, if you call on the Father, if you call on the Father who judges each man's work impartially, you live your lives as strangers here, and you live your life in reverent fear. Holiness means living in reverent fear of God. See, Peter says there in verse 17, look at it, he says, God is our Father. When I was growing up, I dearly loved my dad. I loved him. But more than loving my dad, I respected him. I respected my dad because I knew if I broke his rules, judgment was coming. <laughs> yes, I loved him, but I respected him. To live in fear of God doesn't mean that we cringe in fear. To live in fear of God doesn't mean that we run and 
hide. No, it just means that we live with a holy awe, and just in awe. It means that we live with respect for him. He's God. You know what's wrong today? We no longer fear God. Amen. Y'all remember years ago the, the group called the Rolling Stones? I couldn't tell you one song they sang. I don't know. I don't know what they looked like. I just remember reading an article. The lead guitarist for the Rolling Stones was a guy by the name of Keith Richards. They were doing an interview one day with Keith Richards, and he was angry. Most of the, the Rolling Stones, and I believe it's the year 1995, 60% of their concerts were going to be outdoors. It must have been in Louisiana because it rained and they had to cancel 60% of their concerts because of rain. <laughs> well, they were doing an interview and the newsman looked at Keith Richards and said, I'm curious, what do you think about the devil? And Keith Richards, without hesitation, said, Ah, said the devil don't bother me. He says, it's that God that ticks me off. Don't he know who we are? Doesn't that God know that we're the rolling stones and we've had to cancel over 60 or 60% 60 of our concerts this year because of God and, and I can't use the words that he used and his blankety-blank rain. See, there's a man that doesn't fear God. My prayer would be that Keith Richards would change his attitude. My prayer is that Keith would have a salvation experience. You know why? Because one day, one day, he's going to stand before the very God that he shook his finger at. We need to be holy. We need to be holy men and holy women and holy young people. Why? Because one day we're going to stand before God and we're going to give an account. Not for our salvation because thank God that's already been taken care of. But we will stand before God as believers and we're give, going to give an account as he examines our lives with what we did for him when we lived here in this world. That ought to motivate us to live holy lives. How many of you men played high school football when you were in high school? None of you? Okay. About four of us. When I was in high school, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have video. We had and some of these young people won't know what I'm talking about. We had 16 millimeter projectors. <laughs> and up on the press box, the quarterback club would film Friday night's game. And then on Monday afternoon, we'd go into the locker room at Tate High School. And I can remember sitting in the locker room Carl Madison, he was about four foot eight. He was a little bitty man. When he addressed the football, he'd take a Coca-Cola crate and turn it upside down and stand up on it so he could look us in the eyes. I can remember the old clackety, clickety, clackety, click of that 16 millimeter projector running. And you know what he'd do? 
For every pass that was dropped, for every missed tackle, he'd back it up and play it again. He'd back it up and play it again. And he'd look at us and he'd say, you big dummy, what was you thinking? I played defense one time. And wouldn't you know it, the one time I went in to play, I had an opportunity to sack the running back behind the line of scrimmage. And as he come around my end, I lunged for him. And all of a sudden, I realized all I did was grab thin air. <laughs> and I remember Carl Madison rolling that, eight, that 16 millimeter. He, he looked at me, he said, Terry, what was you thinking? I wanted to say, Coach, I was thinking, boy, that dude's fast, you know. <laughs> but I didn't because I feared the coach. Everybody would play on Friday night. And if they ever messed up all weekend long, everybody lived in fear. You know why? Because they knew come Monday afternoon they were going to have to give an account. Are y'all listening? It is appointed unto man once to die. And after that comes what? Say it. Judgment. Everyone under the sound of my voice, you're going to stand before God one day. And you're going to give an account on how you lived your life. I'm telling you this morning, I say this in love. Knowing that should cause every one of us to have a desire to live a holy life. God says, be holy. For I am holy. Don't you sit there right now and allow Satan to steal your joy. Because let me tell you what the devil would do. Who does that preacher think he is? You know you can't live holy. I didn't say go out of here and live a perfect life. I said go out of here and live a holy life. You can be holy. You can be holy. You can be holy. I can be holy. Because of the one who lives in Let's pray. Mm. Do you live a holy life? Have you died to self today? I pray this morning that you know the Lord Jesus. If you're sitting here in this service today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, you need to come. You need to give your heart and your life to Jesus. Do you have a relationship with him? here today and you don't have that relationship I'll be at this altar but the Sean's going to be at this altar this morning and well, we'd love to pray with you I believe that there are those today you need to come and join our fellowship just come be a part of what God is doing here at Middleton
I pray that as the Holy Spirit has examined your heart today, your life, that if you have not been living a holy life, that you'd allow the Holy Spirit to right now begin to do a work. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him right now to fill your life, your heart to overflowing. out of here today and live holy for Jesus. Now, Father, bless this invitation. Move, Holy Spirit, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me? Our heads are bowed in attitude of prayer. As Brother Kirk sings, I invite you to come. You come Softly and tender the Lord now in our tithes and offerings we give back to King Jesus boy he's been good to us amen he's blessed you he's blessed me and so he instructs us in his word that a tenth of our income our tithe that's his it's not ours and he instructs us to give it back so men if you'll come let's worship him let's pray together father I thank you for your blessings Wow, you've been good to us. You always meet our needs according to your riches in glory. Would you bless now as we give to you your tithes and our offerings for the furtherance of your work here in this community and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Okay, Wednesday night at 5 o'clock, we're going to have a meeting, and I need everybody on board. This Wednesday night at 5 o'clock, we will have a meeting um, pertaining to next Sunday. I need lots of volunteers, need lots of help. And um, so we'll have an organizational meeting this Wednesday night, and we'll talk about what all is going to happen. 
the different areas that I'm going, we're going to need help in. Um, we're planning, I, I'm planning on a thousand people being here, okay? And we had about 600 here for the egg thing. So I think we'll go, I think we're going to have a thousand. That's what I'm believing God for. Woody Jenkins, uh, he talked to him on the, the other night. He called me, kept me on the phone. But listen, he said, he laughed when I told him we were going to have a thousand. I said, I'm planning for a thousand. He said, are you kidding? He said, you better have room for a 13, 1400. He says, I believe that's probably what you're going to end up with. So, you know what? We'll do something. I don't know where we'll put them, but we'll do something. But you need to bring your lawn chairs, okay? Because most of all the activities are going to be right out and back. And um, we're going to be sitting behind the tabernacle all between A and B dorm. The stage is going to be set up out back across the drainage ditch back there. You'll be able to see and hear everything. We'll have a great concert. Brother Kurt, your band is coming, your group that you've sang with for several years. We've got other people that are going to be singing. The music will start at 6 o'clock. Okay, 6 p.m. is when the music will start. We're going to begin with the national anthem outdoors. Now, we'll have other things next Sunday morning, too. But everything outside starts at 6 o'clock, and we're trying to get all this worked out and timed out perfectly. It's just going to, I want you to enjoy the day, okay? And um, like I said, about 8.30 or so is when we'll have fireworks that's going to light up all of Northern East Baton Rouge Parish, okay? So you don't want to miss that. I don't want you to think that we've gone over to Livingston Parish to the firecracker stand and bought some fireworks because that's not what we've done, okay? I'm talking about what you'd see in New York City or somewhere like It's going gonna, it's gonna to be awesome. So you invite people, yes. Yeah. yeah, normally we would have lunch next Sunday because it's the first Sunday, but we won't do that. It'll be at 5 o'clock next Sunday evening, okay? Hamburgers, hot dogs, chicken nuggets, chicken patties. If you want to make a chicken sandwich, you can make your own. <laughs> Am I right? I'm all right. Yeah, I'm going to be sure I'm getting that right. I need you to bring lettuce and tomato and all the good, you know, fresh. Anybody got fresh tomatoes out of the garden? You do, Miss Becky? I'm not talking about now Walmart. I'm talking about you. <laughs> Want fresh right out of the garden. Okay. So help me spread the word. Let's fill the place up next Sunday evening. Any other? You have inquired today? Yes, I have a couple things real quick. If you have not seen Miss Corey about your Liberty Celebration T-shirts, please do that ASA. Please, like today, because uh, we've got to get those ordered in this week. Can you put those announcements up there so they can see those? And then, um, <laughs> um, so Tuesday night, six thirty, uh, we're having a men's prayer meeting in the prayer chapel. So if you are men, would you please come to that? We're going to pray through some things. Got some uh, things we're working on. Just need to, to pray and ask the Lord to, to help us with it. And then yes, choir practice four thirty tonight. Uh, I, I can't stress this enough. Stress this enough. You don't have to be a soloist. I just need your smiling face. All right. So come be a part. If you want to play in the orchestra, we're working on that as well. Uh, so anything else, you you can just come be a part. That's what our shirts are going to look like, okay? It's got the state of Louisiana on there, and they will say, what is this? Liberty Celebration, okay? And the congregation, everybody's wearing blue. Everybody in the choir is wearing red, okay? So if you've not yet purchased your, they're just $10. You need to be, hey, that's a great way to help us promote our church, okay? So you get your one, and... Um, I don't, want to see, I don't want to see a celebration shirt from 20 years ago. Somebody said, well, I'm going to wear mine from several years. No, wrong, wrong celebration, okay? This is Liberty Celebration and not Freedom Sunday. Liberty Celebration. I'm going to get that right for it's over with. 
Yes, we're working on that. We now have a children's minister, and he is actively working to get take care of that. That it falls under his ministry category. So we are working on that as well. Any other word before we go today? All right, guests, we're so glad you come worship with us today, and hope and pray you'll come again. We'll worship with us here at Milldale. Love to see you. Have something I'd love to give you before you leave out today. All right, let's stand and we'll be dismissed. Pray for dry weather this week. Yes, we got children's camp starting tomorrow. All this week will be children's camp, and that's grades three, third grade through the sixth grade. So if you've got children in that age group and you're not enrolled them for camp, please do so. We promise you, your children have a wonderful time. We'll love on them. And they actually come and stay right here all week, stay in our dorms. We've got counselors that will be right here with them. Lots of activities going on. So just keep Milldale covered in prayer all this week. All right, let's bow for prayer and give God the praise and glory. Remember the three that we prayed for at the beginning of the service today. Pray that God will continue to bless and protect those that will be in surgery or whatever this coming week. Brother Jimmy, would you close us? Yeah.